Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call. And on today's podcast, we're going to talk a little bit about stretching. We're going to do a little Q&A is what we're going to do. I just published a podcast yesterday on stretching David Goggins' What If, Mm -hmm. where he goes into his personal experience on how jacked up his body had become from never stretching or massaging or doing any soft tissue work. And it sparked a lot of questions. Got a lot of people who went to the YouTube version of the podcast, and those people left questions in the comment section. So Brent is going to read the Gritty Broman. He's going to read a few of those, Mm -hmm. and uh, we'll just talk about them right now. So what you got for me, Brent? Two questions. One's very specific, and the other one's a little more generic. The very specific one is by BJ Hamola. What stretches do you do to help your slipped disc? I have a bulging disc in my low back for about a year now, and I've been trying all sorts of things. All right. That's a great question. I actually have covered this a couple of times on various shows at random times. I should just do an episode about that, which I think mm-hmm. I will, because I just did one about achy knees. I'll, I'll, I'll do a show fully dedicated to what I did for my, my low back. But for now, I'll just kind of high level drop it for you. I started having back pain. Uh, I was like, I don't know, 33 something like that. And I was playing basketball like four days a week. I was playing some pickup games. And then I played in the Portland basketball league where I had two games a week in the league. But weren't you also biking to and from work every day? I was biking to and from work every day. I was very active. I did some triathlons, but I did not ever lift weights at all. And I sat in a desk for hours on end. Like, sometimes 12 hour days, eight hour days, and then I'd go work out. But the sitting I think is what really, really hurt my back over time. Yep. And, uh, maybe the biking as well, like hunched over and riding the bike and not having good movement. At the end of the day, I feel like what caused the problem with my back was poor movement and sitting it was a combination of those two things. Like when you play basketball, here I am in the studio here, you're bent over like this. And if you don't have good leg strength, you're not down like this with a flat back or a straight back. You're standing up like this, keeping the ball low to the floor with your back completely bent. Yeah. Right. And when your legs are tired, that's what you do. You keep them straight and locked out. And then you, you bend over like this for those that are watching and you play basketball like this for hour after hour, day after day. My back is tightening up. And you're, yeah. At you right it's a now. whole lot different than when you're down here like this in a crouch position and you, you dribble the ball and you move and your back is straight. Okay. So you do that, that poor movement pattern over, over and over and over, over again, over. put a lot of strain and then you sit in a desk like this. And when you look at your spine, If you look at a spine diagram with someone sitting down, hunched forward, your spine is like you have your little donuts, your Mm -hmm. little discs in between each vertebrae going up. And those donuts, when you're hunched forward like this all day long, which I was over a computer in some Mm -hmm. obscure hole in the wall office as I was consulting in some company, as your disc is is the cartilage or the little thing the donut that's in between each vertebrae, your vertebrae lean forward like this and they sandwich forward and they pinch that disc, right? Because you're bent over. And the backside of your back, that disc starts to bulge out the back just because you spend so much time in the forward position like this, like hunched over, that you're compressing all those discs and you're pushing them out, out your back. Does it make sense? Mm-hmm. You following? Yep. It's easier with a picture or a diagram, but yeah. Basically, your lower back is trying to support your upper body because it's leaning forward constantly or mm-hmm. chronically, mm-hmm. and it's causing that lower disc as where all that pressure is at really is just slowly being squeezed out of place. Right, and then once it comes out far enough, okay, yeah, have a bulging disc. It's bulging. Congratulations. It's coming out, and it starts it starts hitting all those nerves and stuff that are running up your spine and pinching them. And then your back, in the midst of all of this, okay, you have all this happening. Your back is, is it's got to protect your spine. Mm-hmm. It's like your nervous system. It's a big deal. It's tightening up. And so your back says, hey, we got to protect this. So it starts to lock muscles. muscles. And then those locked muscles make it so you can't hardly move, mm-hmm. right? And sometimes what you do is pinch the nerve so bad, like 
you've lost feeling in your toes and mm -hmm. and you have severe pain, right? And it's debilitating. And I remember just feeling young and all of a sudden I started having these issues with my back uh, to where it would just give out. Mm -hmm. Like if I bent over, I'd just like almost fall to the ground. Like it just, someone just stabbed you in the spine and cut off feeling to your legs. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it was bad. It was real bad. And it got to a point where I couldn't really do anything. My, my quality of life had gone down the toilet and uh, I ended up going to the doctor and it didn't happen overnight. It was just slowly getting worse and worse and worse. It was a kind of a buildup that I ignored for a long time until it got to a severe point where it just was so messed up. I couldn't, couldn't function. And so I went in and uh, saw the doctors and so forth. And, and then they did an MRI and other things and they found some bulge discs. And so then I went down to a physical therapist here we get into what I did to fix the problem. And I've had a lot of friends that have similar back, back pain and back issues. And I feel too many of them just give up on life. They quit. Mm -hmm. They don't fight through it. Here's what I would say. It's a long process, long process, but it is worth it. And what I did was uh, the physical therapist, I went to this gal. She was really cool and she was not unpleasant to look at, which made uh, the visits <laughs> that much better. more enjoyable. And uh, she was funny. And she's like, look, you're going to get through this. This is not a permanent thing. I know it feels like it. Mm -hmm. I know it's extremely debilitating because it's just this invisible like torture and you mm -hmm. can't quite figure out what caused it or how to keep it from happening. Right. And I didn't know a lot at the time about the issue. It just was there. The first thing that she had me do was lay on my stomach and she wanted me to perform them, do the McKenzie method every day or, or use the McKenzie method to restore my back, my low back. You can Google that the McKenzie method. It's basically, I know it sounds really weird, really simple, but it's basically like the Cobra position in yoga, mm -hmm. you know? So if, uh, for those that are watching you, you, you're like this and you go up like that. And you mm -hmm. stretch your back in reverse, mm -hmm. right? And it's like you do 20 of these. And what she had me do was just arch up like this and stretch my back in that reverse position, okay? And she was saying something to the effect of, you have spent all this time smashing your donut between your vertebrae mm -hmm. one direction. So it's fat on one end and super, super skinny on the other. And you need to spend an equal amount of time bent the other direction to squish it back down and have it go back the other way. Visually makes sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's really what's going on. Super simplifying it probably. Probably. But the McKinsey method works, period. Mm -hmm. It just works. And, and it's universal. People talk about it all the time, how well it works. So it's pretty remarkable how effective it is over a long period of time. So what I started doing was when I went into that position... I'll show you here on the video. When I did this, on the to, I, I couldn't even, Brent, I couldn't even like go up this high. I couldn't even oh, hardly go up. Like a plank? Like, like as I arch my back backward, it was so painful. I, I couldn't arch at all. By the time I was like five months into it, I could go like all the way back. So whenever I leaned back, and you can be in a standing position, and you can lean back like this as well. Whenever I leaned back like that, it felt like something stabbed me in the back. Mm. It was torture. It was rough. I mean, any backward arching at all, and it caused severe pain. She's like, I said, what feels better, what gives me relief is bending forward and touching my toes. Mm -hmm. and she's like, yeah, that's, that's what you intuitively think is the right thing to do because that's what gives you some immediate relief, mm -hmm. but it's actually making things worse. worse. She said, I don't want you to bend forward at all ever. And that's all I had been doing was bending forward. Mm -hmm. When things got tight, 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 I just bent forward, bent forward, bent forward, bent down, touch my toes, touch my toes, stretch more, stretch more, stretch more. I never bent backwards. I never arched my back the other way. And when I arched it back, even just a little, it was like, Oh, ouch, ouch, ouch. So it felt like the wrong thing to do. Mm -hmm. Like that was the problem. And she's like, no, actually you need mobility both directions. You need to bend the, the, the other way. 
So it started out with, you know, she's like, I want you to lay on your stomach and arch your arch upward. And I want you to do that for as far as you can without it pinching like severely. And I want you to hold that position for 20 or 30 minutes while you're watching TV or something. And she wanted me to combine that with like every 15 minutes to 30 minutes at work, laying on my stomach and do basically arching up and then going down, arching up and then going down, arching up, going down. And that process of doing 20 or 30 of those and then stand up. And then in addition to that, I had a standing desk. I went to a standing desk instead of a sitting desk because any sort of sitting just wrecked me, just absolutely wrecked me. And it still does today. If I sit for an extended period of times, I have back problems. And so I'm, I'm such an anti sit human being. Like mm-hmm. I stand at a desk all day long. Yep. Now sitting is the new smoking. Yeah. They say that. And I believe it sitting, I think wrecks you, especially if you do heavy deadlifts and you, mm-hmm. and you do some kind of ba- intensive back work and then or hip work, and then you sit down like like we're sitting right now, mm-hmm. and you take all those tense, tight, wrecked muscles, and now and they're shorten. healing, and they're healing in a stuck position, mm-hmm. in a forward position, and it's it's wrecking your your body. So I had a standing desk, and I would do those arches and arch backward, and I would try to sit down as infrequently as possible. So at the office, when we had meetings, I would stand in the corner. I stood at my desk and I started riding the bus to work so I could be standing the whole time I rode the bus. I didn't want to drive my own car because then I'd be in a sitting position. I had like a five-minute car ride to the bus station and then I'd get on a bus and I'd stand 45 minutes in the bus to to the office or a train. And then I would walk in, be at a standing desk all day and when we had meetings, I'd stand. And when I went home, I'd lay on my stomach. If I wanted to sit down or something, I would never sit. I'd just stand or I'd, if I wanted to relax, I'd lay on my stomach and I'd arch backward. And I virtually just spent all my time kind of going the opposite direction as I had been going for years. And as I did those push-ups, kind of those, those back arches, every 15 or 20 minutes, and I'd stand and work at my desk and I'd just drop and do 10 and just stand at my desk. I did that for couple years. And the first, at first it was just getting back to normal. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I did, I got to where I was, I could walk around and I felt good. But if I sat down and for even an hour in a car ride, otherwise I could go days without back pain. So I knew that I was making progress, but here's what would happen. Anytime I did anything semi-physical that bent forward, it would bring it right back. So something is like a hip thruster, you know? Mm-hmm. So let's say you just want to, you know, you're messing around with the significant other, you know, hip thrusting, and then bam, your back's out. Yeah. It's real debilitating. I was like, I don't even feel like a man. Like I can't, <laughs> I can't do one of my favorite things. It's a, it's a problem. I remember going into the physical therapist because I'd been feeling great, getting a little cocky, and then um, my wife and I had a hotel and we, it was like a, a little anniversary thing. And the next day, I couldn't walk. My back locked up and I was bedridden. I could not walk. And I thought I had made all this progress. And then, boom, I was so jacked. And I was really upset. And I went in there. And she's like, hey, hey, life ain't over. You've made progress. You're going to be fine. This is just part of the process. You'll get back to where it's really strong. You're young. It's just a process. So I went back to the drawing board and did that. But needless to say, I was really skittish about doing, for example, sit-ups. Like Mm -hmm. if I did sit-ups and bent up and touched my toes or crunches, like my back would lock up, just lock up. The fact that I couldn't do a sit-up was just discouraging. And I hadn't played basketball in like a year because it just would wreck me. Okay. So like I said, it was the McKenzie method. It was never sitting down. It was standing desk at work over a long period of time. Then I got to a point where I was feeling pretty decent and I decided to start doing assisted sort of sit-ups, trying to build some core strength. And so what I would do is we had like the P90X video Mm -hmm. and it was like Ab Ripper X. 
And, yep. you know, you, you sit on your back or you sit back here and you do the bicycle with your legs, mm-hmm. you know, raise them in the air. And that sort of thing would be really hard for me. I had nothing there. So what I would do is I would do it assisted or scaled. So I would hold on to like a fixed surface or have a rope or something that was tied to something that I'd use to kind of hold me up while I raised my legs and did bicycle kicks and different Mm -hmm. things. Or when I did a sit up, I'd use the rope to pull myself up just a little bit. And so everything I did in the beginning was not full body weight load. It was Assisted. assisted. And I was really careful just to slowly build up the muscles for that. It took like a few months and I was starting and I would do the plank, a lot of planking and other things to build core stability. And after, I don't know, it was probably six months. I was able to do sit-ups, touch my toes, be real strong in my low back. I kept doing that. I want to say I did that P90X routine, followed the routine P90X. I skipped the plyometric section because that would hurt my back. And, uh, I dabbled with the yoga section, but really I did legs and back and Mm -hmm. and, in the push and pull or whatever. And I did the the ab ripper thing, right? It was mostly all body weight, maybe some dumbbells. It's pretty light. And I felt good. And I was like that for a couple of years, a few years, but he still never felt really strong in the low back. Then I discovered CrossFit and that's when things really changed because what I did there was I went and started doing squats deadlifts and overhead presses, putting a bar overhead in each of those movements. I had no idea how powerful they were Mm -hmm. to make me like indestructible, like a really robust and strong low back and hip. Like what I, what I didn't realize was how much mobility I lacked, Mm -hmm. how much strength I lacked through full ranges of motion and how much external loading would help me versus body weight. So I could do a billion air squats. You know, you do the P90X stuff and you're doing these leg squats off a chair and different things, one legged things and all this, uh, you have dumbbells and you're doing some, but there's no comparison to that versus a 200 pound bar on your back. Mm -hmm. That external loading just, just is, you're able to achieve stress on the system, bone density and stuff that you just can't get with Mm -hmm. body weight. It invokes a hormone response. You can't do otherwise. It's tough to do. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. So what happened was I started doing squats and learning how to do proper movement patterns. I realized I had a terrible movement. I didn't do things correctly. You know, my squats were knee bends. I, and I'll talk about that on the achy knee show here coming out in a few days. I didn't have good movement patterns and I didn't do external weight lifting. When I added all that together and I started I remember I was talking to my brother-in-law, Bryce, and he, we were both into CrossFit heavy and he's a beast. And I watched Bryce do a deadlift of 500 pounds. I was like, dude, if I even do a hundred, I'm worried I'll blow out my back. I'm just scared to death. Mm -hmm. And then I decided, you know, that's probably exactly why I need to do it. Mm -hmm. So I loaded up the bar just with my body weight, like a 90 pounds. And I started doing the deadlift, which was scary because I felt like I hadn't lifted with my back in a long time. Mm-hmm. It's totally different lifting with your legs with a straight back, mostly vertical, like a squat versus bending over and deadlifting a bar with your back, with your actual back. That's the sort of thing that my spine and my ruptured discs are saying, mm, I don't know, you know, like mm-hmm. this is a risk. So what I ended up doing was. I started doing deadlifts and doing them really, really slowly with really lightweight, with low reps, inch by inch by inch. And within a, two years, I had the world's strongest back. Like I, I had the strong, within two years, I had an incredibly a different life. And I truly believe that the deadlifts are critical for having that strong back because, because what I found was, you know, I was always at risk of being hurt again or having some kind of problem because I didn't have a really strong posterior chain. I didn't have a really strong back. I really just, I didn't, and I still have to fight for it. 
you know, I can do squats till the cows come home with a heavy, ridiculous mm-hmm. weight. As soon as I bend over and have to pick up a bar, like in a deadlift position, my back really struggles. It's not a, it's, it's not a good thing for me. It's, it's hard. But what happened, I remember talking to my brother-in-law, Bryson, he would do max deadlifts, max effort deadlifts. And when he'd lift them, if he couldn't lift them, he'd just be like, I can't lift it. But his back didn't have a problem. He just failed the lift. For me, it was like, if I tried to do a max effort deadlift. Yeah, snap in half. And I failed. It, it's, I failed because the back said, nope, not doing this. Yep. And something went wonky back there. Something slipped. And Bryce said to me, you know your back is healthy and really strong when you can go for a max deadlift and fail it and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hmm, maybe. So I started deadlifting, like I said, really slowly. Mm -hmm. And I never maxed anything. I just did higher moderate reps and moderate weight, you know, lower reps. And over time, a couple years, I got to where Bryce was right. I would go pick up a heavy bar and it was like my back was so jacked and healthy that if I picked it up and I couldn't pick it up, it's just too heavy. I just was like, I just stuck there and I just put it down. My back was fine. But a couple of years before that, it would have, it would have just, it would have just, it would have just snapped. Something would have gone wrong. I still do the McKenzie method. I still backbend all day, every day. It's just part of life. I do it in the morning. When people ask me what stretch, I do, I, I do the, the Cobra, whatever you want to call it. I do the back bend Mm -hmm. and I'll do it standing. I'll do it laying down. And here's the thing I mentioned the other day, the psoas muscles that connect to your spine. David Goggins mentioned it, right? That psoas muscle tilting his pelvis forward. He didn't even know it, which had like shortened his body like by two inches. So he didn't stand tall. And it had been jacked up forever. Well, what does the McKenzie method do? What does that back bend do? Backwards. It makes the psoas mm-hmm. stretch. So I was saying how I don't have a problem with the psoas. Like I don't even know. But maybe I did. Maybe that was a big part of what, I did. what the issue was. But I've done the McKenzie method now for 10 years all the time. So much so that maybe my psoas that's that's just it. My psoas is longer and looser, and it maybe maybe it is that that I that I because I backbend for so long and it's part of my routine. Uh, Kelly Starrett said, "Hey, for every hour you spend hunched forward, bent in this position, you mm-hmm. should spend equal hours bent back the other way." Yep. Well, that's an eye opener because when you think about how many hours you st- spend sitting down mm-hmm. in a hunched chair, over a hunched over, he's saying you should be laying on your stomach in the back bend for the same amount of hours. Mm -hmm. That means if you're sitting at a desk eight hours, if you want to have a healthy back, you got to sit on your stomach and lay lean back for eight hours. Who's going to be able to do that? No one, unless you just don't sleep. So that is really an eye opener for back care. That right there tells you, okay, you have a job to do to, to not sit. Yep. It minimizes as much time as you can in a sitting position. Just don't do it. If you can avoid it. Get into a desk. Now, for me, you know, when I shoot a podcast, it's this is about the only time I sit was true. when we record this a podcast. True. Otherwise, you watch if me. You go up to Brian's desk, there is no chair. I have a standing desk. In my my old studio, I had a desk on the wall that I would flip out and I would stand at that. Everyone would come in and be like, You have this massive table and all this stuff, and and you're over here on this little thing on the wall. Mm-hmm. I don't care. It's standing, standing is king. One thing I always keep in mind is how many hours do I spend in a standing position? I also will say this, that people don't realize how important it is to be able to squat and do a deep squat and have their hips open up Mm -hmm. and have their back stay strong and all of that. That mobility also, I think, has made my back strong. So that's why I'm a strong advocate for, for squats as well. And then finally, when you take heavy weight, be a couple of dumbbells, some kettlebells, a barbell, and you stick it over your head for just a press, or if you're just going to walk around and do lunges or movements, when you have weight overhead, it causes all these little stabilizer muscles in your trunk and in your core to develop mm-hmm. and be strong. So when you put a backpack on and you start hiking, 
mm-hmm. and you lean left or lean right as you're going over a log, you have a lot of core strength there because you put weight overhead up higher and you know you do different things with it and it r- really helps you have a safe, strong trunk core strength. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> uh, that's kind of in a nutshell what I recommend. Look up the McKenzie method, start there. And then uh, if you, you know, don't sit down, follow my journey, I think you'll be surprised. It's not just one thing. It was a process over a long period of time. But here I am, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, leading, going toward 46 years old, feel stronger than I felt in my 20s. Yeah. I just want to say one thing about that psoas muscle. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a tight psoas and it was causing me stomach issues. Like I thought I had an upset stomach, mm-hmm. but it was really, it was just this tight muscle that's like, have you ever like gone to a masseuse to get a massage for your psoas muscle specifically? No. Do you mm. know how that goes down? It's a little creepy. Isn't that a little close to the groin there? You know, like a um, little- <laughs> it kind of is by the groin, but it also goes up your stomach quite a ways. Yeah, I know. Like, like under the ribs almost. Yes. Under the bottom ribs, yeah. And so they basically, so I, I went to a, a sports medicine mm-hmm. and it was a gal and she's this tiny little lady and she basically did like kung fu knife hands <laughs> and then stabs into my left side uh-huh. and, then, and then shifts back and forth with her knife hands so she finds the tight muscle, pokes down with her hands close together and then pulls them apart <clears throat> and basically just stretching that muscle over and over again. Wow. And I had to go see her three times to get that muscle on, you know. Yeah, unstuck. But I also had to take a week in between because she was physically bruising my my stomach and my guts. And then the other thing she had me do was go buy a yoga ball. Yeah, yeah. And lay on the yoga ball. That, if if for now, like, I'll just lay on a yoga ball every once in a while if I feel like that muscle getting tight. When you say lay on it, not not forward, but you're... Your, Your stomach back. is in the air. Yep. Yeah, it's a back bend. Yeah, it's it's, it's a cheating back bend. Yeah, one hundred percent. Like yeah. I'm not using any muscles to do it. It's a nice way to sit back and relax and just let your body, yeah, just relax into mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the psoas is is no joke. Like you can get it can get bad. That so right seems to change some people's lives. And the, it, that thing digs in and hits those psoas muscles and your hip mm-hmm. flexors, and it's like it. That's that giant creepy. hard plastic U shaped thing that yeah. you like. I just don't use it that much because it doesn't do anything. It it, it does a little bit, but mm-hmm. I'll tell you, for me, the Theragun has been absolutely life changing. So I've been using the Theragun. I have also a car buffer at home that I mm-hmm. use. Yep. Um, I have lacrosse balls. So I have this one muscle, and we talked earlier that I on another podcast that I have Poland syndrome. Yep. I'm basically missing a bunch of muscles. I have this one muscle. It's right here in my shoulder, the front part of my shoulder Mm -hmm. that compensates, I believe, for my lack of a right pectoral muscle. Right. I cannot get that thing to loosen up. The only thing I have not tried is a needle. You've Mm. seen people go in and hit the muscle with a needle to loosen it. The thing is, is it could be, you know, you're you're unique in that Mm -hmm. regard, but it could be something completely, it could be something somewhere else Mm -hmm. that's making that thing lock up. It's it's been tight my whole life. and I've And I've... My entire life, I've never truly gotten it to loosen up. Yeah. I want to try some needle therapy. It's kind of yeah. a, one of my, my Hail Marys. I'm yep. looking into. I want to have someone on who does that. Do we have anyone? Yep. Right Ooh. here. Mountain Physio. Oh, cool. Come stab me. Yeah. Let's do this. Um, yeah. I think the psoas is one of those muscles. I honestly think that, you know, there's no reason to give up. Just start mm-hmm. working on stuff. Start working on stuff. So that's, that's the main stretch that I do. That's the main one. Mm-hmm. And then, well, that's the other question that we have here. The more mm-hmm. generic one I was saying from Bill Steiger. Says, yeah. Brian, awesome show. Great topic. Do you have specific stretches that you would recommend? Yeah. So that McKenzie method, back mm-hmm. stretching, all that, that is huge for me. That is a, that is a morning, evening, afternoon. That is an all day standing. Mm-hmm. I'll do it standing. Everyone in the office here has seen me do it a billion times. Mm-hmm. I do it in the gym throughout my workouts in between like, important for me but uh the other thing that i'll do is i have that stretch where i lay on my back i'll do it right here on this table and you'll see my lack of mobility in this Mm -hmm. regard but you know i basically get like this cross my legs while i'm on my back and then i reach through and grab my my knee like this Mm -hmm. and then i pull and curve my head up and 
right there, that gets this hip flexor mm -hmm. right in here that's always tight right back here. So for those that aren't watching, Brian is on his back on the table. He has thrown his right leg up and over like he's like sitting crossing his ankle over his knee, mm -hmm. reaching between his legs, grabbing his left leg, and using that as a fulcrum to pull both of his legs up towards his chest. So yeah, that position helps with those hip flexors. I do that one a lot. And then I always do a quad stretch, you know, which is you bring your ankle up and mm -hmm. you pull it up and stretch that quad. That's a very common, I do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Although I don't have real tight quads. Mm -hmm. um, so I do that. Anyone who has looked at the P90X videos, mm -hmm. the Tim Horton, or is it? Yeah, I think so. Old stuff, but. The, the real hero in those series is Adam, the black guy. <laughs> so what I have found is the warm-up section and the stretching section in the P90X, I pretty much knew if I went through the warm-up process that they do at the beginning of every video, mm -hmm. I could do a pretty thorough workout without getting injured. For years, I just copied the warm-up routine, which was like mm -hmm. you stand in place and you raise your knee, your legs up and knees to your waist knees to your hands, your you know, yeah. And then it was like jog in place and just a little warm-up thing. And then mm -hmm. you have your arms and you do these little circles and but reverse, and then you turn your hands around and you go longer, mm -hmm. and you do that, and your shoulders are burn from the movement. Mm -hmm. There was like some lunges forward, lunges back. And then there was groin stretches and touching mm -hmm. your toes and these poses, some of them yoga-ish, you know. Mm -hmm. But the whole warm-up took like, I don't know, five minutes or less. And as long as I went through that warm-up routine, and, and it was funny, the first time I did the warm-up, I was like, this is the warm-up? This, this is like a workout. <laughs> it is. You know, until I, until I, you know, got in better shape. And mm -hmm. then it was, yeah. it was, it was super easy. That little warm-up routine and the stretches that we did, Depending on the workout, if it was a leg day, it was a little bit different warm up because they wanted mm -hmm. the, a lot of blood in those legs, legs and stuff, and stuff yeah. before you did the exercise. And then there was some cool down stuff. So I really appreciated that part of the P90X videos because they they gave you a good warm up and mm -hmm. they gave you a good cool down. And I found that as long as I did that warm up, you know, I would have really good results. Um, during your workout, during my workout and after my workout where I didn't pull anything or have mm -hmm. anything get jacked up. Now I, I should add in here before we close this thing, we should close it. I, I would say the other thing that I added to this that was critical at this time was I stopped eating bread. I stopped mm -hmm. eating carbs and sugar. They're very, they caused a lot of inflammation in my gut and the rest of my body. So I, I started changing my diet. I was like, okay, meat, vegetables. I'd stick to white rice and sweet potatoes and things like that. But I bailed out of the whole junk food diet that I kind of had been on. I also was more aware of the omega-6, omega-3 oil thing. I stayed away from industrialized seed oils. I stayed away from bad oils and tried to just stick with good oils. So I was taking in avocado now and olive oil and butter, real butter, mm -hmm. grass-fed beef butter kind of thing. And I was staying away from vegetable oils and canola oil and those sorts of things. And uh, so I started getting the good kind of anti-inflammatory oils into my system and stopped taking in the pro-inflammatory. Yeah. One thing that a lot of folks don't understand is like omega-6 oil, and this is a really simplified version of this. Yes. So when you twist an ankle, Brent, you mm -hmm. twist it, snap, and you're like, oh my gosh, that hurts, and then it swells up. Mm -hmm. okay? Which is one of the worst feelings in the world. That's inflammation, yep. right? You're causing that to swell. Your body causes it to swell. That's good. Mm -hmm. It's part of the healing process, mm -hmm. right? It makes it so you can't move it and break yeah. it or hurt it worse. But then you need that inflammation to go away. So it can heal. So, so it's part of that healing process as well. Time and a place for all things. So what happens is when you cause it to be inflamed because you've snapped it and now it's mm -hmm. filling with blood, that right there is good mm -hmm. and it's omega-6 oils. Now, when it's time for you to heal, like have the swelling go away and to clear out, mm -hmm. that's omega-3 oil. Mm -hmm. 
right? They're, they're, these are the fats that are, are in your body that clear it. That move the inflammation. The standard American diet, As like some do. 99, 90% of what you intake in your normal crappy day-to-day diet, if you're not mm-hmm. aware, is almost all omega-6. Six. Six. Yep. All your industrial seed oils, your your corn oils, your sunflower. When your body is absorbing oil, absorbing oil through its cells, it absorbs it at whatever rate you can, at whatever ratio you consume it. Does that make sense? Not at all. Okay. Let's say you're eating some meat and I do that often. And that meat is half, 50% of its omega six and 50% of its omega three. Okay. That's, that's what's in the meat. Let's say you eat it, then you absorb 50% of one and 50% of the other. Okay. Right? So when you sprain an ankle, you get 50% of what you got on hand is, is, the six. is the stuff that makes it swell up. And then 50% of the oil in your body is the other oil that makes it go away. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right? Good. Yes. But the standard American diet we just mentioned is pro- like disproportionately 90% omega-6s. Correct. Because, for example... Let's take a cow, Mm -hmm. a cow that eats grass, right? Grass-fed beef. Grass-fed beef. Grass is basically half and half. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what the exact ratio is, but for this analogy. Half and half. It's basically half. Let's say it's half and half, okay? So grass is growing. It's getting sunlight. Half of the oils that are in it that a cow can absorb in nutrition is going to be omega-6, and then the other half is omega-3 sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So a cow, its fatty tissue is half and half. Mm -hmm. Now, corn. Corn is all omega-6. No threes. No threes. Vegetable oil is pretty much all Mm omega-6. Sesame seed or safflower seeds or sunflower seed oil, they're all, they're all, yeah, palm oil. They're all, almost all Mm omega-6. All right. So when a cow is fed a typical corn-fed diet Mm -hmm. on a food plot, in a in a food plot, he is consuming ninety to one hundred percent omega six oil diet. Mm -hmm. So now that beef that you're eating is mostly omega six, maybe not even any omega threes. Correct. So when you eat it, you absorb it. Your body doesn't. Your body absorbs it at whatever ratio you eat it at. Mm -hmm. So if you eat it. At 100%, everything you eat, an Oreo cookie, vegetable oils, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's funny a, to think that frosting is having an Oreo cookie. It's just vegetable oil with some sugar in it. Right. You look at, uh, you know, Do a lot of the this? stuff that you fry. Okay. It's omega-6, right? Mm-hmm. Um, French fries at the, at the at restaurant, omega-6, fry oil, you know, all these things. That's how people consume And that's why their diet, that's why they have an inordinate amount of omega-6 in their system. All right? So is this making sense? Yes. So what you want to do is you want to absorb a diet of omega, like half and half, Mm -hmm. like a one-to-one ratio. For every gram of fish oil, and that's omega-3, you want a a gram of omega-6. It's not like omega-6 oils are necessarily bad. bad. They're just super prevalent in today's society. They're everywhere. They're almost unescapable. Yes. The idea here is when you eat grass-fed beef, grass-fed beef butter, grass-fed, grass-fed steak, you know, you're getting this nice mix of oils that are healthy for you. What I did was I became aware of some of these things and I started taking fish oil. And I mentioned this in a podcast earlier. I also started taking calcium, shif, vitamin, shif magnesium and vitamin D calcium. And uh, I like that Shift brand. It seems to be work for me. It's the capsules, the gel caps. It's the only one that I found that really works well. Mm-hmm. I absorb it well. It works well. So the Shift calcium along with just right now, I just use Kirkland fish oil, the cheap stuff. And I don't know why, but when I buy omega-3, like direct omega-3 oils, it doesn't work the same. And I think it's because they heat it up so much to get the omega-6 separated from the omega-3 just take the fish oil yeah just the way nature intended just who cares if it's got omega-6 mixed into it along with the omega-3 all i know is that straight up fish oil i seem to respond better to than omega-3 fish oil 
Does it make sense? Yep. It's like when they take milk and they ultra pasteurize it for Right. You. Sometimes it's just the cheapest form it comes in and the less mm-hmm. molested, the better. Yeah. If you really want to get wild, take f- fermented cod liver oil. Oh. Like cinnamon tingle. My wife has horror stories of her dad. So her dad's older gentleman. He's like 75. Yeah. And uh, he didn't have kids till he was like 40 something. And he would frog march the kids up there every night. And they all had to take a spoon of cod liver oil. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's what I was doing was I was taking, uh, you know, I forget fermented cod liver oil. And uh, now I take, I, I'll do that, but it's not cheap. And it was cinnamon have, tingle, by the way. It was wh- the flavor. Why does it have to be fermented? The reason that fermented was ideal is uh-huh. they don't heat it up to get the oil out of the liver. Oh, okay. So ferments. So cod liver is a fish. Cod is a fish. Yeah. And it has a liver. Mm-hmm. And the, they are pulling the, the oil right out of the liver. And uh-huh. it's high in vitamin K and A and what? I don't know. I'm no doctor. But so it's got all the right stuff in it. Does the fermentation process just kick the... the it sort of rots or ferments. Uh-huh. And the oil comes out naturally. And it stays... It doesn't ever heat up. Because omega-3s are really susceptible to heat. Mm-hmm. Where they get damaged and they, they, they go bad. They're really unstable. They go bad quickly. So that's why that works well. But coconut oil, it's got a lot of great properties. Omega-3, it can sit on your counter forever, mm-hmm. for years. And it doesn't, it's highly stable. I've Olive got- oil, as long as it doesn't get heated up super hot, it's a great oil as well. It, it's, it, it can last a long time. But you're not supposed to fry in olive oil. No. Because olive oil isn't built for that. You know, no. it'll, it'll denature the oil and damage it. So uh, these things I started to become aware of. And so, like I said, shift calcium, fish oil, and, uh, glucosamine, liquid glucosamine. I started taking that stuff. The Wellis, I think is what it's called at Costco, but it's mm-hmm. just liquid glucosamine. It's like a red, white, and blue bottle. Yeah. I added those three things to my diet. And then I started to get rid of all the sugar in the, in the garbage and the, in the breads. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, I avoided Foods that have omega threes or omega sixes in them, I eat all these wild meat now. So you add healthy meats and stuff. Your chicken eggs get good ones there as well because if they're eating corn the whole time, then you're yep. getting tons of omega sixes and not the threes. And it turns out that you can't just compensate for a high omega six intake diet. You can't just compensate for that by taking just more fish oil. Yep, you have to cut it out. You have to actually. They found. For results, you have to restrict the intake of the omega sixes. You have to actually be disciplined, and you have to cut out all that inflammation causing stuff. You can't just add good stuff to it and keep doing that. You have to get rid of the crap and bring in the good. Like I was like, because that's what I started doing. I go, well, if I I actually had my blood levels tested, and if and I turned out on my normal diet that I had a twenty to one ratio. That means for every 20 grams of omega-6 in my body, for example, I'd have one gram of omega-3. Well, you want a one-to-one ratio, like a 50-50. Mm-hmm. 20 to 1 was my average ratio. 20, 20 to 1. To one. Jeez. It's no wonder you can't clear inflammation. It's no wonder that when your back or your muscles get tight, you can't make them unbe- and stop being tight. You know, I would take ibuprofen because it would reduce swelling, but that was bad. It would, it was like kicking the ball down the road. It didn't actually heal anything. It just postponed the inevitable. Mm -hmm. It just delayed the disaster. So that's why it's important to get that diet straight. So that, that's what I started to do. Um, and then I moved on from there to, to continuing to do all those exercises at the same time. And, you know, that whole combination has made me. Much, much healthier today. That's that, different that should answer questions, right? Don't you yep. think? Okay. I know there's more. I want to respond to all the comments when you guys log in and, and you know, you type up on YouTube. Um, we're, we're a little behind right now. It's been a little crazy with things. So, but we're just getting this content together and out the door. So hopefully you, you appreciate that. Leave us a comment, ask us questions. We'll try to get to them. Really appreciate uh, all the support. We're giving away a, uh, side by side right now, a Polaris Razor Turbo Turbo S. Yes. It's legit. It's legit. And all you got to do is 
buy something at Mountain Ops, use the code Gritty, you get 10 extra entries. Every five bucks you spend gets you uh, one entry to win. Mm -hmm. And it could be you. It could be. Could be. Could be. So somebody's got to win it. Somebody's got to win it. Someone is going to win it. Someone is going to win it. And we're going to hand them the keys on May 15th. So it depends, you know, I mean, it could be you. It really could. And all you got to do to have a chance, spend five bucks. So check that out. Go to mountainops.com. And uh, every time someone does that, by the way, and they use that, they use the code gritty, it just helps us with that partnership and it helps us continue to do what we like to do and uh, bring you the content that you enjoy. So, or I assume you enjoy because you are listening now. Uh, And then, yeah, check out Sissy Sticks, get some trekking poles, check out Heather's Choice, get some backcountry foods, packaroons, check out uh, Seek Outside for all your shelters and stove needs. And check out Graxaw Game Bags. Check out Valkyrie Archery. All those companies you can find links to in the description field of these videos. And uh, at every one of them, you can use the code GRITTY and you will save some moolah. And uh, like I said, all those things help us out too. So we appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty.